Okay, I uh, hope you all can hear me here. Sounds pretty good. Uh, welcome to this talk on Spring Boot apps on Kubernetes. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are actually Spring Boot developers or how many of you are Kubernetes developers. Maybe we can raise your hands. How many of you actually develop Spring Boot apps? All right, that's a lot of you. How about Kubernetes? How many of you have actually used Kubernetes? All right, that's a few. So it's actually more boot, boot developers than Kubernetes developers, but that's good. That's what I kind of what I expected. Uh, so what about me? I am, uh, my name is Thomas Risberg. I'm a member of the Spring team at Pivotal. And I've been contributing to uh, Spring Framework since about 2003. And I just realized that it's actually 15 years since Rod Johnson published his first book with a code that later became the, the base for the Spring Framework project. That's pretty amazing that it's still alive and kicking. And Spring Boot takes Spring Framework to another level. And I just looked at the Google search stats for Spring Boot and Kubernetes, and I knew they were both hot technologies. I didn't realize how well they tracked each other. If you look at it, there's a little blip here in the holiday season where they took a holiday together. So it's pretty interesting. So what is actually Spring Boot? So Spring Boot takes an opinionated view of building a Spring Framework project or Java projects. And Josh Long said it's basically pair programming with a Spring engineering team. And I think that's a pretty good quote. So Kubernetes, on the other hand, is a system for managing containers. And it's based on code that's been developed uh, over 10, 15 years at Google. And to me, that is the same thing as Spring Boot is pairing with the Spring team. Then Kubernetes would be basically the same thing as pairing with a Google's engineering team. And so let's just quickly talk a little bit about containers, how they fit into our development. And there are different layers of abstractions that we work with. And basically, containers kind of fit in the middle just above the virtual machines. Then if you look at about there come when you're just managing your apps. And even further, more abstractive from everything is when you start working with functions as a functions as a service in the serverless programming style. Another way of looking at it, what do you worry about as a developer? Do I worry about a container? Do I worry about an application? And do I worry about a function? So these are basically three very different abstractions that are getting very kind of the three most popular abstractions out there right now. And the higher up the chain you go in the functions, the more do you expect the platform to do for you. The lower you go in terms of the containers, the more you have to do as a developer to configure the containers, make them run, all that, and scale them and all that stuff. So I just want to start with a very quick demo. How do, how do I get going with a Spring Boot app running on Kubernetes? So I have a very basic app. So it's basically one class, the Hello Application Java. I created this using the Spring Starter Initializer. And let me go back to the slide. There's a link here to uh, the demo document that actually outlines exactly what steps you have to do. Now, there's a lot of stuff to cover in 30 minutes about boot and Kubernetes. So I don't think I'll have time to go through all of that. So that's why I took the time to put together step-by-step -step instructions how to s get this simple hello, uh, hello app up and running. And I also have a little more involved examples as well. So the first thing you would do is to install a Minikube. 
which is the way you can run Kubernetes on your laptop. That's great for development. Once you start deploying things, you probably want to run it either on a hosted Kubernetes server or something you set up yourself to run on one of the cloud providers. But for just plain development, I think Minikube works very well. And there's a command line utility that you use that's called Cube Control or Cube Cuddle or Cube CTL. People call it all different things, but I typically call it Cube Control. And that's basically a command line to control how you deploy your applications. So you start up your Minikube, and after that gets going, I just created a very simple boot app with this curl command. I just specify the boot version, and I want the web, and I want an actuator. And once I've done that, I added one REST controller method into this app that was generated for me by the Spring Initializer. And I used the curl version of that. You can go to start.spring.io. And you get this familiar, I hope, hopefully most of you have already seen this one, where you actually set up your starting a new Spring application. So I added a REST controller mapping, and just to say hello, and I just en I enabled an endpoint so I can see the actual environment that we're running in, which is interesting when you start up something in uh, Kubernetes because you get a lot of environment variables populated. And I set up a Docker file because everything you deploy into Kubernetes has to be a Docker container. And there's a trick, like if you run Minikube on your laptop and you want to build your Docker images right into the same environment that Minikube is running in, you can just run an eval and grab the Docker environment from Minikube. That way, whenever you do Docker commands, they will actually use the same Docker environment that Minikube is running with. And then I just do a plain Docker build. And to deploy it, let me just make sure I do the Docker build here. Can you see that font? Make it a little bigger. So we got a Docker image. Next step is to actually run this in Minikube. So cube control run the name of my app, the image that I just created in Docker, and what port the app is using. And using the cube control, I can see what pods are running. Like uh, Kubernetes uses this pod notion, which is one or more containers grouped together. And for this example, there's one container running in my pod. So that's what I'm seeing. That's why I'm seeing one out of one. There's only one container in there. If you have m multiple containers, you see two, three, whatever number of containers you have. And it's running. So now I should be able to expose that deployment which I just created, and I want to be able to access it from outside Kubernetes. So I need to expose the ports. And this creates what they call a service. So now I have a service that I can actually ac access, and I can use a minikube command and look for, find what the URL is, and that's the actual URL and the port that it's accessible through. So now I can actually just call the hello endpoint 
using the same Minikube command, and it actually did work. Hello, Kubernetes. Now, I said we exposed the environment endpoint, so let's take a look at what Kubernetes is exposing. So a lot of environment variables we see here. And some of them are interesting, some of them maybe not so, but the, there are ports exposed and service names. And that's interesting because if you start up a database service, you, you'll see that service name in here and you can actually access it from these environment variables. We'll see that example later on. But we probably are not going to use uh, this cube control run command to run every app. We want to have more of a declarative state for our application. And that's when you use these uh, deployment files called the old YAML files. So you can actually take a look at what is actually running what the deployment looks like in the YAML file. So it shows you all the different things you have to specify to get this running. And this one, it's actually more than you have to specify, but you need to give labels so you can tell Kubernetes what pods you want to access. You, there are also different namespaces. We're using the default namespace, so you can have multiple apps running in separate namespaces and they don't actually collide with each other. And here we see the container specification. So when you start deploying more serious apps, you definitely want to create your own deployment descriptors. And or same thing for the service. And that way, Kubernetes has a blueprint for what state you want the app to be in, and it will try to keep that state, or as close to that state as possible. Once you're done with this little demo app, we can delete it, and there are labels assigned to all these resources running in Kubernetes. So we can say show labels, and we see that the run command added a run label with the name of the app I'm running. So now I can access that when I want to delete things. I can say delete all and the label whether it's run equals hello. And it should get rid of the pod, the service, the deployment, and everything. So this is all well and good, but what about some more complex examples? How do you build apps for Kubernetes to take advantage of not just getting one app, Hello World app up and running? You want to manage a lot more about your app, like who does it talk to? How, how do you find a database to talk to? How do you expose your ports? We saw a little bit of that. And what is, how do you configure your app? And Kubernetes does not really have a strong opinion on how your app's going to be architected. But it does provide a number of things. It does provide all the environment variables we looked at a little earlier. It does provide a way for you to specify configuration files. And it also has something called secrets, which is basically, basically a configuration file, but the secrets are hidden, or they're encoded, so you can't see them. and you. You can control the access to these secrets. And they can later on be exposed as environment variables for your app. There are also health checks where 
Kubernetes will call your app every so often and make sure it's up and running. And if it's not, it will kill it and restart it. That's how it tries to keep your app consistently up and running as many instances that you require. And it also has a DNS based discovery of services. So if you start a MySQL database, depending on how you name the service, but if you name it MySQL, then there will be a MySQL DNS entry that you can use for configuring your apps. So quickly what we looked at, we have the deployment resources. They use config maps and secrets. And the deployment creates what is called a replica set, which will keep track of how many pods you asked for. If you ask for three, then it will keep three pods running for each app, for each deployment. And there's a service that lets you access these pods from the outside. And depending on where you run it, you can, it might provide an external load balancing, which is not available in Minikube. But in Minikube, you can get to the service through the Minikube command and find out what port it's actually running on. So if you look at externalized configuration, which is important for any kind of serious app, the environment variables are important. They're easy to set when you deploy your app. You specify what environment variables you want. If you have complex Spring Boot properties, you might have to use the Spring Application JSON trick for, to getting the, the map-based properties to actually get picked up. And like I said, config maps and secrets are provided by Kubernetes. And uh, the way you can use them, you can either pull in a config file or a secret and have that exposed as an environment variable, or you can actually mount the config map, which is, I'll show you an example of what it looks like, and then have that be part as a mounted as a file in your application. So when boot starts up, it will see this config file and read that like it would uh, config files right out of your jar as well. And of course you can also use any of the other Spring Cloud features like a config server. And there's a trick where you can actually use a, there's something called an init container. So instead of just your main containers, as part of the, you can specify for your pod to have one container when it, it your app is initialized and you can actually write something, write your property files using an init container. That could come in handy every now and then. So I have a step-by-step -step demo for a little more complex app. Same thing, we start with a curl command to create, and this time we have a few more dependencies specified. So it's a web, it's a JPA, it has the actuator, it's a data rest, it's a MySQL and HSQL database drivers. And it's basically a simple REST app to manage actor class entries. So it, I just created a name and an age and uh, created a repository, a Spring Data JPA repository for that. I don't like to code too much, so I use these convenient paging and sorting repositories when possible. And then I create some properties for this file to get it running. And these are all, 30 minutes is not terribly long to go through all this in detail, but if you're interested, these, I have links to all these uh, demo apps. And you can run this standalone, or you can run it using a MySQL database deployed on Kubernetes. So I have the deployment configuration file for MySQL here. It basically shows you the container you want to run, 
the root password is an environment variable here, which is pulled in from a secret in when I run the app. <coughs> and then I create a service for my SQL so the app has something to connect to. And the thing is, if you have multiple pods running behind the service, there's only one service. So it kind of does load balancing across the different pods. And then you do want to persist your data, so you will have a persistent volume claim, which is another Kubernetes resource that creates a persistent store for your data. And here I create the secret with a password which is encoded. I deploy it and then I, in my Java file, I added a Docker plugin because I like to have that built through the Maven build. I'm using the Spotify plugin for that. It works pretty well. I had to downgrade Hibernate because it was, didn't like some of the options I picked. And then I created the co configuration files. And now let me look at the more important ones here. So the volume mounts I was talking about. Here I mount the config file. And I call it application Kubernetes YAML. I start all these up in the profile Kubernetes. And by naming it application dash profile name, it will be higher precedence than anything I provide in the jar file. So I can override pretty much any value I have in there. So what does a config file look like? Well, it's basically a config map. I give it a name. I give it the data. And here I just have an basically an application YAML file. And this is just a YAML format like you would do an application YAML if you put it on the class path. It's just indented a little bit to make, make it fit the config map YAML. So you deploy it all and then you can play, play around and test it out. I have one more advanced microservices example. And it looks like we're not going to have time to go through that too much. But this is actually three different apps talking to each other. And maybe I'll come back to that at the end if we have time. So this is just uh, Example of the config maps, we, we just looked at that in the code. And the secrets, similar. It's encoded, but once I pull it into an environment variable using the secret key ref, it will be decoded and my app will actually get the actual value. Now there are a lot of other options for the Spring Cloud Netflix projects. They have all this the cloud configuration, they have service discovery, load balancing, circuit breakers. Some of these come in handy if, you, if you're running even, or when you're running on Kubernetes as well as if you run on other clouds. So uh, <coughs> I use two of these, I use the net uh, load balancing no, actually, I use the circuit breakers, Hystrix. And I also use uh, the tracing with Sleuth in the sample app. So Kubernetes helps us with the externalized configuration and the service discovery through using the DNS lookups. Circuit breaker, distributed tracing, metrics, log aggregation. It's basically, it's on you to figure out how you want to do that. Some of the Spring Cloud projects help out. And 
definitely the distributed tracing is very interesting. Once you start running a lot of microservices together, you want to follow the trace. And there's also uh, another project you want to keep an eye on. It's called Istio, which is uh, what they call a service mesh, which does a lot of load balancing, routing, enforcing policies, like what microservice can talk to another microservice. So it's definitely an interesting project, and it's it's developing pretty rapidly, and I, w I would expect it to be more popular over the next year or two. So for log aggregation, there's nothing specific in Spring. The Spring Cloud Sleuth does format the logs in a format that works well with uh, some of the log aggregation frameworks out there. And basically, you just have to look at what your platform is using and try to use that. Just want to mention another. There's a packaging project called Helm. It's like once you have three, four, five different microservices that you deploy together and a database and a Zipkin and a few other apps, it gets kind of hard to manage. So Helm lets you develop a package so you can just say Helm install and the name of the package that you develop. And it basically is templates and uh, a value file that you overrides, that you can provide overrides for. And uh, you can either publish these charts, as they call them, which defines all your apps. I have a, see if we can find one there. So this is what a chart looks like. It's a deployment, this example, and then you have all these placeholders that when you deploy it, they get filled in either from the name of your template or some template code or through values you set in a values file. So the values file here says actors, I want replica counter one. So when you deploy it, you can override that. And you specify what Docker image you want and version. And again, you can override that when you deploy it. And it will keep track of your deployment of something they call releases and their version. So you can roll back and you can roll forward again. So it's a, it's a convenient way to manage a larger system. And there's one more project I want to mention. It's called Spring Cloud for Kubernetes. And it's part of the Spring Cloud Incubator. The only issue with it now is that it doesn't support boot 2.0 yet. So if you're on a boot 1.5 project, you could use this one. And it works well for uh, reading config maps and secrets instead of mounting them, like I talked earlier about. You, uh, you let the Spring Cloud Kubernetes library actually read them in. You just specify the name of the config map or secret that you want, and it will read it in as a property source and provide that to your Spring Boot app. And it was originally developed by the Fabricate team over at Red Hat, but it's now part of the Spring Cloud incub incubator. So, summary. What do you do? You use config maps, mount them as application Kubernetes YAML, and provide the Kubernetes profile when you deploy your app. You can access secrets and environment variables. You can use Spring Cloud Sleuth for tracing with Sipkin. And I use Micrometer since I have a Spring Boot 2.0 app the, for my samples here. And you can then pull up the metrics in Prometheus or Grafana. And keep an eye on Istio, because that's where things seem to be moving. 
and use Helm for packaging to simplify installation of your app. And the last slide has some links. If you have any questions, either ping me on uh, Twitter or uh, open a ticket on an issue on the, one of the demo apps, uh, repositories I have there Paul, on GitHub. Uh, I hope you found this useful and I think our time is up here. Thank you. There's a lot to cover here, but hopefully you, you got something out of it. And you can look at all that demo code out there. I have links to all of that.